God. Like I said, first service, surprise, surprise, surprise. I'm here and I'm speaking. Maybe I should go, huh? <laughs> no, it's a good thing to be here. It's a good thing to be here. So, uh, well, I have uh, got something on my heart. And uh, like I said, first service, it's um, something I had never taught on before. So uh, if y'all believe with me, we'll go forward and we'll do what the Lord has for us to do. And uh, we'll see what comes out of it. Maybe it'll be different than even first service. I don't think I've ever preached the same thing twice. So we'll see how we do this time. Glory to God. If you would, turn with me to First Timothy chapter 1. It's good to see y'all's faces. Y'all looking sharp. Yeah. Yeah, y'all got prettier since I left. Whatever y'all are doing, keep it up. Yeah, y'all are getting prettier. So, First Timothy chapter 1. It says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, Of whom I am chief. Chief sinner. Jesus came into the world for what? Save sinners. He had a purpose when he came here. We are to follow whose example? Jesus' example. So let me ask you a question. You ever laid in bed or woke up in the morning time and wondered, pondered in this brilliant mind of ours, Why am I even here? What's my purpose? Why am I here? You know, we all have a purpose. There's something that we're all supposed to do. There's a reason that every person is here on the earth. There was a reason that Jesus came to the earth, and there's a reason that you came to the earth. God didn't just scratch his head one day and just say, Okay, zoop, there they go. No reason, no purpose, there's nothing. There is a purpose for each and every person that's sitting in here today or watching by the Internet today or whatever. Look at your neighbor and say, you have a purpose for being here. And you know what? That purpose, don't laugh at them. Some of you were laughing at them when you told them, no, no, they do have a purpose. Yeah, it's not to see how much possessions we can get. So that you can be show and tell and tell your neighbor, I got more to keep up with the Joneses. It's not to see how many kids you can have. To impress people at how good a parent you are. It's not to see how much knowledge you can attain by how many schools you went to. There's a purpose you're supposed to be here. And God gave each and every person a purpose. You know, I said, touched on this Friday night, and uh, it's been really wonderful, you know, being down there a little bit in Sarasota and, and being able to touch shoulders, per se, with the world and come in contact with different people, kind of get out of your normal circle and get back in contact with people that you are not normally in contact with again. And uh, it has been very, very interesting, the things that we've come in contact with. I mean, on a daily basis, we're in contact with sinners. People that don't know God. And you know what sinners do? They sin. And they don't keep their word. And they lie. And they steal, and they tell you they're going to be there at this time and do this for you, and they don't even show up. Much less late, they just don't even show up. And they tell you they'll do it for this price, and they do it for this price. And you know what? They'll steal from you. The other day we went in, and somebody had stole all the Dave's Mountain Dews. (laughs) I thought he was going to cry. That's what sinners do. You ever been a sinner? Yeah. 
that's what sinners do. And we shouldn't be surprised that that's what they do. We shouldn't be surprised that when they look you in the eye and say, I'll be there at three, that they don't even show up. Or we shouldn't be surprised when they say, I'm going to bring you this many of this grade of something or another, that they lower the grade by this many. You shouldn't be surprised by that sort of thing, because that's what sinners do. But now sinners should be in shock by your response. Because they're used to dealing with the world. And we've had them. It has been the most amazing thing there. That when they do something crazy, we don't yell at them. And they're like, I know the other day uh, we were dealing with one situation and um, it was over some money stuff. And finally Dave looked at the guy and he said, you know what? That's a lot of pressure for you to make that change right here and now. Why don't you take some time and figure up what it'll be and come back and tell us? And the guy went, what? They don't understand that. Because they're used to people nailing them. Give me a figure now and lower it by this much. Well, he lowered it and we came out really, really good. But we loved him anyway. Sinners do dumb things. And I told the guys, I said, you know, they stole the Mountain Dews. This is what we need to do. We need to get us a big, huge ice chest and take it to them and say, so you're thirsty? We noticed that. Well, God loves you and He never wants you to be thirsty. Here, have a bunch of Mountain Dews. And here, not only the Mountain Dews, let us buy your lunch. That's what we are to do with sinners. We're to go just the opposite of what they're expecting us to do. We're not supposed to play their game with them and get in their arguments with them. Look with me, if you would, at 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 18. You know, God put you here for a purpose. And I personally refuse to go one more day and think about the people that I come in contact with and what could happen to them if they don't know the Lord. I mean, we've come in contact with some really, really nice people. But nice won't get you into heaven. And we've had some nice neighbors and we've had some nice co-workers and we've had some nice people... I mean, I've had co-workers that work for me, and, and I've walked into their homes, and uh, different ones. I mean, one of them, their brother-in-law owned a chop shop, and another one I walked in their house, and they had a razor blade out on the table, and they were cutting whatever that stuff is up, you know, and drugs. And, and sinners, they do dumb things. But you live your life before them, and their lives will change. I refuse to let another one go down the different paths than God set for them and my purpose of being here and helping leading them in the right direction. What about you? Why did God put you where you are? What is your purpose for being here? What about the people that He put around you? I told the staff the other day, we we had a little staff meeting, and I said, you know what, you work 40 hours a week. And during that time, you're doing this, and you're doing this, and the phones are ringing, and you're doing accounting, and you're doing emails, and you're doing all these things, and losing sight of the most important thing. Because the most important thing is the services. Because if the sound is not right, or the lights are not right, or the church is not ready, or the different areas are not taken care of, there's not a service. So therefore, there is no tape to get out. 
There is no TV to go out. There is no internet to go out. So the word is not getting out. There's nothing to get out. Well, what about your purpose? When you wake up in the morning and you've got your 40 hours, what has the devil done? Has he twisted your purpose in life to be that you wake up in the morning and the first thing that you think about is, I've got to get up because I've got to make some money to pay my light bill. Or I've got to get up and believe God today that my marriage doesn't fall apart. Or I've got to get up and deal with my kids so they don't get messed up or they're failing their classes. Or I've got to get up and, and deal with this job again and my boss and what he's de- uh, making me do. And go through every day and wake up in the morning and go to bed at night and feel like life is totally useless. You're just going through a routine every day. And at the end of the day, when you lay down your head on your pillow at night, it's like you've really accomplished nothing. You just went through another day. Well, it's not supposed to be that way. There's a purpose that you're here. And there's really only one thing that brings you joy, is fulfilling that purpose. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 5.18. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, that's good, but let's read it out of the Living Bible. It says, All these things are from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ Jesus did. Now, look at this next part. It says, And God has given us the privilege of urging everyone To come into his favor and be reconciled to him. Now, who is that talking to? God has given us a privilege of letting everybody know how wonderful he is. He's given us a privilege. It is a privilege to be able to tell somebody about God. It is a privilege that he set your co-worker next to you that's going through that test and trial. He didn't set him next to me, a minister. He didn't set him next to Keith. He didn't set him next to somebody else. He set them right next to you. Because he knew exactly what you knew. And some people say, well, I can't witness. I'm not a preacher. I don't know the Bible. I don't know where that scripture is. You don't have to know hardly anything in order to be a witness for God. I want you to practice this with me. Can you do it? Your coworker comes in and they're crying. They're having severe marriage troubles. Are their kids on drugs? Or they got an evil report that something's wrong in their body. And you can tell it. They're acting different today. Do you have to get your Bible out and find all the scriptures on healing for them? What can you do? You can take them by the hand and go like this. You can say, God loves you. It's going to be okay. You just minister volumes to them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You just ministered huge amounts to them. You let them know there was a God and that He loves them. And not only that, that you love them. But the most important thing is what you do after that. If they steal your pen and you chew them out, or your parking place, or your lunch, or your chair, 
It's how you live the rest of the time that matters after that. That's what us, we're seeing it all the time with the, with the people down there in Sarasota. Everybody that we come in contact with. I know I was dealing with our attorney and uh, when we first bought the building. And uh, I didn't even think about it. It never crossed my mind. But we were transferring emails back and forth. And um, I do, you know this, I say silly things sometimes. We got into the closing that day and she told kids, she says, we got into some really tense situations and she was always putting something silly in there and made things that were could have been really tough and really intense and, and lighthearted and fun and easy. She said, I, I don't think I've ever dealt with anything like that before. Well, that's you. That's your job. To minister peace in a situation that could be like this. To make it lighthearted. To make it easy. God set them right next to you for a reason. We are, it goes on to say in uh, verse 19, For God was with Christ, restoring to the world, uh, the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. But for some reason or another, we've gotten that backwards. We have decided that when we get up in the morning and we wake up, instead of putting on this shirt that says, okay, today what my job to do is and my purpose for being here is to see how many people I can minister the Lord to, we put on this shirt that says, judge. Judge every sinner or every person that I come in contact with. Judge what they're doing. Tell them if it's right or wrong. Now, how many of you like to be judged? Raise your hand. How many of you like to be told everything you're doing is wrong? Well, what about a sinner? I mean, at least you know if God loves you, He's going to correct you. Now, what about a sinner? You think if you point out all of his faults, it's going to help him a lot? No. The thing that we should do is minister God's love to them and tell them that whatever they've done, it's okay. God loves them. We get up and we put on our shirt of love and we look past all their faults. We look past them stealing the coke. We look past them not showing up for work. We look past them lying to us. We look past them trying to steal something from us. And we ask God for wisdom. We don't just let them get by with everything. It's like this one guy that we were dealing with down there. I mean, uh, when he first started working, he told me he's going to do this and he's going to do this and he's going to do that. Well, time went by and those things weren't getting done. Well, you have a choice then. You can stand there in their face and yell at them and scream at them and do what the rest of the world does. Or you can ask God for wisdom. And so this particular day, I think Dave had talked to him. I think the other guys had talked to him. And I said, Lord, what do we need to do on this? And so I just called him and I said, you know what? I said, "Uh, I know you are busy. And I said it just like that. I said, I know you're busy. I said, because you cannot do anything for the Lord and his church. And he not prosper everything else that you're doing. I said, so the minute that you set foot on these premises, I know every other thing, every other part of your business began to prosper. I said, I know it did. And he said, you wouldn't believe it. Everything just went wild and we started getting so busy and we started... I said, I know it. That's the way it does when you start doing things for God. I said, that's just exactly what happens. He said, we just, things just started going in every direction. I said, I know, that's what happens. I said, but if you could, stop by here. I'll be there in an hour. You know, and he was. Well, now, what if we would have chewed him out? Do you think if we would have chewed him out or cussed him out or railed him, number one, that he would have showed up? Number two, that there would have been an opportunity to minister the Lord to him later about him getting saved. 
What did that do to your witness? What did it do? And you're the one that God put in their path. There's a reason that God directed them to come to work for us there at that building. There's a reason they're on our premises. There's a reason God directed you to go in that store. I remember one time years ago. I don't know what we were doing. Maybe we were out on the motorcycles or something, and I went in this store and asked this guy for directions. And uh, I told Keith, I came out and I told Keith, I said, he was so nice. Keith went in there and gave him some money and told him, thank you for being so nice to my wife. There's a reason. There is a reason. It ministered to that man. There's a reason we crossed his path that day. And you should wake up in the morning thinking, not, I'm here to do a job and take care of my bills and pay my house payment and do this and do that. You have a purpose for being here. And I do not want to let, I refuse to let another day go by with people that I come in contact with that I don't minister something to them about them heading them in the right direction. And you don't have to preach to them. It's called L-O-V-E. And you minister love to them and you start to see them turn and turn and turn and they'll begin to turn in the right direction toward the Lord every time. Glory to God. And that's our job. That's who we are. Look at this with me. Mark 16, verse 15. It says, He said to them, Go ye into all the... Say that with me. Go ye into all the... Go ye into all the... Churches. Go ye into all the... Mm. And preach the good news to all creation. Well, Keith is teaching on the good news, so I'm going to leave that alone. But I am going to stick with this one word, the world. It has seemed like Christians have gotten in fear about getting into the world. They've gotten in fear about doing business with the world. They've gotten in fear about putting their kids in the world. They've gotten in fear about putting their teenagers in the world. They've gotten in fear about doing anything with the world anymore. We can't be in fear about coming in contact with the world. If you have a child and they're in school... They should be a witness to every other child that's in that school. Every other child is sick with the flu. Yours is not. Or every other child is failing. Yours is making A's. Or every other child is rebellious. Yours is an example of kindness. Or you have a teenager and every other child is running around doing drugs or doing something dumb. Your child knows how to resist it and come against it when somebody offers them something that they shouldn't. We cannot be in fear. The same thing with you. Doing business with the world doesn't mean they're not going to try to rip you off. But you should be trusting God for the wisdom of how to deal with that situation. That money is not as important as that man's life. And God could have hooked him up with you if you were led to do business with him for you to teach him and love on him of how to come to know the Lord. There's a purpose and a reason that you come in contact with every person that you come in contact with. And it's not to preach to them, you better quit cheating people or you're going to go to hell. There's a way to minister love to people. Oh, that's okay. I know you overcharged me. That's okay. You probably, you know, uh, something. Ask God for the way to deal with it. 
there's a way of getting the wisdom of God in every situation. And he'll tell you what that way is. Turn with me to Acts, if you would, um, chapter 16. One way that you find out how to deal with it and not be afraid of the world. In the NIV, it says, The churches were strengthened in faith and grew in numbers. The Amplified says it a little bit better. It says, The churches were strengthened and made firm in faith. How do we learn to resist what's going on in the world? Or how do we learn to teach our kids? Or how do we learn to teach our youth? Or how do we resist temptation that comes against us in the world? That's why you come to church. So that you can get that firm foundation on how to deal with the neighbor that you know, um, does something dumb and everybody's had a, a neighbor that, you know, does something you'd prefer that they didn't do. I remember one time we came in from a trip. We had been gone a few days and we came in from a trip and the neighbor thought they were going to be kind to us. And um, they cut down all of our trees for us to be kind. You remember that? <laughs> thought they'd take care of it for us. So we wouldn't have to fool with it. Sure did. And it was all of our privacy trees. There's a way to deal with it. Soon after that, I'll tell you the other part. Hearing a little bit about it. You know, you have a choice when you wake up in the morning. You have a choice because of what's going on in your life and all the mess that you're living in and all the things, situations that you've got to deal with to put your pressures off on other people or you have a choice to love other people and be the witness that God set you to be. I'm really, really believing and I totally refuse to let the world think one more bad thing about God. Because of what some Christians have done. Going into businesses and saying that they're Christians and give me a Christian discount or chewing people out and all in the name of God. And it's not God. God's not anywhere around it. Because the Bible says in John that the world and our brothers and sisters will know us by what? Love is supposed to take no account for a suffered wrong. Wait a minute. Did I say no account? No account for a suffered wrong. How much is no account? Well, just a little. You can chew them out just a little bit. Well, they did me wrong. They hurt me. You don't understand. No account. They're sinners. That's what they do. Your response, you have one response. There's only one response that we have, and it's called... Love. That's our response. And if we want things to change, then that's what we've got to do. I said this in first service and I'm going to say it again. Think about this with me for just a minute. Say there's a city close by. And it's all over the news and it's flashing on the internet and it pops up on everybody's cell phones. And you hear it everywhere. That this city close by, and if you're on the internet, it's one close to you. You know, it's a city. And there's word that a a horrific, horrible, horrendous fire is going to hit this city in a week. 
And it's going to burn everything up, everybody up, everything that's in it. It's just going to burn. Smoldering nothing is going to be left. And you're given the opportunity to go and help people get out, pull people out, pull things out, get people to safety. What would you do? What would you do? Would you sit at home and watch Wheel of Fortune or NCIS or reality? Who's going to win the singing show? What would you do? That's what we're doing. Because that is going to happen. Maybe not in a week. I don't know. Maybe not in a month. But it is going to happen. And maybe it's your neighbor. And maybe it's your coworker. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's your brother. Maybe it's your sister. And if you can't walk in love with them, hell is real. And it's bad. And we are saved, and are gain, when we get saved, we gain God's love inside of us. And we gain the strength, whether we want to admit it or not, of the greater one inside of us. And because of that greater one inside of us, we have the ability to take no account to a suffered wrong. We have that ability. Your flesh can scream as loud as it wants to when somebody mistreats you. But you and I both know that we have a choice. I have a choice when somebody mistreats me. I have a choice to get my feelings hurt, to get upset, to chew them out, to retaliate. Or I have a choice to walk in love with them. Who is supposed to be the example? We are. We're the ones that are supposed to have the greater one living inside of us to where we can win the world by our love. And the way that we're able to do that is by the greater one inside of us. So when your co-worker stabs you in the back to get that position, I heard somebody go, mmm. <laughs> or we have a saying around us working down there, they threw me under the bus again. <laughs> All eight wheels hit. We joke about it a lot. What if they do that? What if they do that to you? What is your choice then? Can you still walk in love? There's a reason that they are there in your life, that God put them there in your life. Your choice is to judge and get upset or to walk in love with them. Because time is ticking to where people are going to be dying and going to hell. And it doesn't matter how nice they are. If they don't know the Lord, that's where they're going. And it's our job to show them something different. It's who we are. It's our love. You know, when we had the Celebration Sunday video, you know, the kids did the different spots. Y'all all remember that? You know, where we had to interview the kids and they said different things. And I remember little Gracie Fast. Um, she got up there and they asked her how much God loves her. And she did her arms like this and she said, God loves me this big. Well, no, I can't stretch my arms as big as God loves me. 
You remember that? But he can. And you know, yesterday when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how big of a God that we have that can not only love us after we're saved and see all the mess-ups that we make when he knows we have the ability to do better. But yet and still, he sent Jesus for all the sinners in the world because he loved him so much. Turn to John 3.16. Let's see what translation I had it in. I know it's here somewhere. I pulled a Keith and got all my notes all scrambled up here. In the Amplified. It says, God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he gave up his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish or come to destruction, but have eternal life. God didn't send His Son into the world to judge the world, or reject or condemn it, or to pass sentence on it, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through Him. And that's our job, is to help the world come to safe and soundness through Him. It's our privilege to be able to help people come, become safe and sound through the Lord. What about whoever ministered to you? Listen to the Message Bible. It says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son, and this is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending His Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was, he came to help and to put the world right again. You can find fault with every person that you're around. But is that our job? It's our privilege to lead them to the Lord and tell them how much the Lord loves them and what he did for them. And I know you think I've totally gotten off course, about what I wanted to do today. The title of my message today is actually Rags to Riches. I've been sitting there in Sarasota watching through the TV camera on what Keith's been teaching on on finances week after week after week after week. And I've been thinking about all the things he's been saying Friday and Sunday and Friday and Sunday. And I've been thinking about us. And what has brought us from where we were to where we are today? And what changed our life? And most people don't know this, but when the Lord gave him most of the revelation, the beginning of most of the revelation about finances that he got, we were like four payments behind on our house. We owed like 10000 plus to the IRS. And we were still married, but by a thread. Why? Because I was demanding that he notice me instead of noticing the word that he needed to teach five new courses at Rama. Now, you've never done anything like that. Demand that somebody pay you attention. And we were messed up. And the Lord gave him a revelation. But before I tell you something about that, I'm going to have Bob sing us a song. I think you'll like it. When we moved to Rama, Keith and I loaded up his little green truck that he called Trigger. And when we got it loaded up, he said, you know what? We look like the Beverly Hillbillies. (laughs) And we did, buddy. Everything we had was loaded in the back of that little truck. And I had a little car 
that soon after we got to Raymer, the motor blew up in it. I mean, we had nothing. And we barely had enough money to get our tuition paid. And I cried the first four days we were there because we were using his tuition money to find a place to live. And uh, I'm not really a crier. And uh, it, was a, it was a tough time. So go ahead, Mr. Bob. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about a story about a man named Keith, poor country boy, dirt between his toes. The Lord told him he should learn to be led, so he loaded up the truck and to Tulsa he did head. Oklahoma, that is. Rama Bible Training Center, Healing School, the dog and the hot rod had to stay behind, following the Lord was always on his mind, rags to riches story, doing what he said, put God first and learn to be led. To Branson, to Sister Sarasota, to World Expansion. Yeah. Tell you, like I told him first service, I didn't get that approved before I did it, but <laughs> might have had a hard time with that one. You know, as he was seeking the Lord about our finances, because they were a mess. I mean, we were in Bible school and everything was going on. Like I said, we owed, it, it was a mess. The Lord gave him several things that we needed to change. And if you know anything about Keith at all, when he gets something from the Lord, it doesn't change. And a lot of times he'll write a letter or he'll give us something. And, and when he does, the secretaries and stuff know, you don't change the wording in it because that came from the Lord. I mean, you don't put this word before that one or that word before this. This is the way it came from the Lord. And so it has significance when it comes that way. And then you can build on it. Well, that's the way this was. The very first word that the Lord gave him was selfishness. And you know what? You ask somebody if they're selfish, they're going to go, no. No. But you know what? We were selfish. Because we were doing what most people do today. We were getting up. We were going to work. We were trying to think about our bills, our bodies, our lives, everything we needed. What we had to have. And like most people, the better house, the better car, the better this, the better that. Selfish. But as I was watching these broadcasts, it hit me like somebody hit me in the head. The Lord gave him selfishness as the first one. And yet he tells us what to do. He says, give. He says, sow. He says, love. And I got to thinking about it. Give, Phyllis. Give to who? People around you. Other people. So, Phyllis, to who? People you come in contact with. Love. Everybody. Now, he could have very easily... Now, he's God. He could have very easily done a beam me up Scotty thing and took all the money and all the stuff when you were given to him. Don't you think? He could have, he could have been selfish and he could have... He didn't need it in heaven, but he could have figured out a way to get the money. If he said give, give it to him. But he didn't. He did it for us to show love to one another. Amen. 
He did it so that as we give, it's a ministering to one another. Continuously. But people say this. They say, I would give to them, but they messed up. I would give to them, but they mistreated me. I'm glad you said that. Turn to this scripture with me. Luke 17. I laughed out loud when I read this yesterday. And I was all by myself. Luke 17, verse 4, in the Amplified. It says, even if your brother sins against you seven times a day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, I'm sorry, you must forgive him and give up the resentment and consider the offense as recalled and annulled. But look at verse 5. This is the funny part. Then the apostles said to the Lord, Lord, increase our faith. I think that's really funny. Because, I mean, they're, they're people. If somebody sins against you seven times in a day, then what are you supposed to do? If they say, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're supposed to say, okay, I forgive them. Then he says, take off that and give it to him. Take off this and give it to him. And they just sinned against me, Lord. But I found this even funnier. Matthew, chapter 18, verse 21. Was it long after chapter 17? You know, 18 comes right after 17, right? Then Peter, 18, 21. Then Peter came up to the Lord and said... How many times may my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let him go? As many times as seven? Well, he just told him seven. Right? Peter's trying to get out of that seven number. (laughs) Peter reminds me of me sometimes. He's trying to get out, maybe less, Lord, than seven. But the Lord fixes him. He says, I tell you, not up to seven times. But up to 70 times 7, Peter. Don't get out of the 7 times in a day. 490 times in a day. They can mess up against you. And what are you supposed to do? So you, any sinner that comes up against you, any person that comes up against you, what are you supposed to do with them? Walk in love. That's our job. That's our purpose. That's what we're called here to do. We are called here to represent the Lord. That's who we are. We are His ambassadors. Ambassadors of His love. And it is a privilege to be able to come in contact with the girl at the Taco Bell or the boy at the Taco Bell. That got your order so messed up, there's no way that you, or whatever place it is. That you didn't get anything that you ordered. You know what? I like refried beans on top of a hamburger. (laughs) I'll take it. I like green chilies on top of my whatever. You walk in love. Because the thing about it is, you don't know where that person came from. And you don't know what else is going on in their life. You may be having a bad life, but that's what brought us from where we were to where we are. That's what I was telling you about the guy with the trees earlier. The guy cut down our trees. It wasn't long after that. It wasn't long at all. We were so broke, like I said earlier, we couldn't hardly spell our name. That we got $500. I don't know where it came from. I know it had to be a miracle of God. $500 was probably like $5 million to us today. And the Lord dealt with us, give it away. Give it away. 
So Keith goes and gives it to the neighbor that cut the trees down. <laughs> right? I don't know that he's connected to the two till just now. I mean, I don't know if he thought about that or not, but I, the Lord just reminded me of that. And the man cried, stood there and hugged Keith and cried. Not saved. Stood there and hugged Keith and cried and said, you don't understand. He said, me and my family were going on vacation. And we had this done and this done and this done, but we didn't have any money. We probably could have used that 500. No, 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 probably about it. (laughs) And I know my own self today. This very day. And all along in our lives. Any time that I have ever seen that there becomes in a little bit of selfishness. Or a little bit, I notice a little bit of lack I begin to check my selfishness meter. What have I been thinking about? If my money's been tight, have I been thinking about our bills? Have I been thinking about our stuff? I'll go in and I'll clean out my closet from top to bottom. He'll do the same thing. I've seen him come in with no shoes, no shirt. No coat. You can't be attached to anything. I told it first service, and I, and I hadn't even thought about it for years and years and years, but the Lord reminded me of it. We were at a Christmas party one time. And, I mean, you would think your engagement ring would be sacred just a little bit. Right? I mean, it's a covenant thing, right? Wrong. There's nothing that you have that should not be used for the kingdom of God. If it is, get rid of it. Make it a point. Everything we have has the purpose of being used for the kingdom of God. And we were at this party and I went to Keith. He was someplace else and I said... You know what the Lord's dealing with me about tonight? To give my engagement ring away. It was a carrot diamond ring. And uh, I said, to give it to this person. And he said, well, just check your heart again. And if it's right, do it. I did it. I didn't know they had filed for divorce. They're married today on the mission field, winning souls left and right and left and right. And this has been 25 years ago. Now, I think back about that often. Had I not have done that, would they even still be together? Because the thing that they told me, she told me, was it just proved to her that God loved her. Now, I didn't preach one sermon to that girl. Not one sermon. I gave her something. I know recently Dan was telling a story, or, or Rob or one of them, about one of the guys that was working for us. And it's, it's just been the funniest thing around there, you know, to see what's happening in these people's lives. I mean, we've been around some of them for almost a year now. And uh, they'll buy their lunch, or they'll do this for them, or they'll do that for them. And uh, this one gentleman um, has got, found it funny about the money stuff, I think, and uh, he'd never heard any of the stuff that we do. And... Uh, so he had gotten a hold of some money. I think he won it in a pot that he'd bet on something. Is that correct? Yeah. And, um, and uh, um, so, um, but the person that brought it to him or something, he said, um, correct me, Dan, if I'm wrong. The, the person that, that brought it to him um, went to give it to him, and he said, you know what? I think you're supposed to keep that. And he kind of ducked his head, and he gave it to him, and um, it turns out they really, really needed it, you know. And uh, so he comes and he tells, he tells Dan about it, and he's just ducked his head and he's crying. He said, just something inside of me in here said, I just needed to give them that. And he was just crying. Well, now, let me ask you a question. 
What is the greatest riches in the whole wide world? People. Nothing we have, nothing we have is more valuable than people. Nothing. There is nothing that he or I has. Nothing. We've never given each other a gift, not knowing, never, that it couldn't be gone tomorrow. Never, never. He, t- he used to tell my family, they'd get mad, or, you know, they'd give it to him. It could be gone in a week, and they'd look at him, you gave it away? Well, of course I gave it away. And that's what things are for. That's what they're for. Are you saying, Mrs. Moore, that we can't have cars and houses or believe for cars and houses? Yes, believe for cars and houses. To give them away. (laughs) But if your focus is just on cars and houses, you're missing it. Your focus should be on loving people. Your focus should be on them. I mean, if you can sit in here today and not care about somebody, whether you get another car or another house or you ever get a reward when you get to heaven, but you don't care about somebody dying and going to hell and spending hell in eternity, something's wrong with you. You're not saved. Because that greater love should be on the inside of you to where you care about somebody else more than you do yourself. That's what salvation is about. That's who we are. That's our purpose. That's who we are. We are to care about our brother more than we are to care about ourselves. And care whether they're going to hell or not. There is no car. There is no house. There is no jewelry. There is no nothing that matters more than a person dying and going to hell for eternity. And until we get our priorities right, there's not going to be prayers answered. There's not going to be things happening in people's lives until we realize the purpose of having these things. If you get up in the morning and the only reason that you're going to work is so that you can get a better house, your priorities are messed up. The reason that you get up in the morning and go to work is so that you can come in contact with that person in that cubicle next to you so that they don't go to hell. God put you here for a purpose. He put me here for a purpose. And I refuse to spend another minute or another day or another hour letting the devil come and throw this against me or that against me or this against you or that against you that gets me off my course from what God wants me to do. And you should be the same way. You don't have to preach to anybody. It said, be a witness for God. You don't have to know a hundred scriptures to preach to somebody. You have to love them. And the minute we quit thinking about the selfishness of ourselves and start thinking about other people, we have never had to believe God for houses or cars or things like that. We've never had to just stand and believe for a house. Oh, I'm going to stand and stand. And every time that we start walking that path that God has for us, I know that house that I had in Tulsa. I mean, we started walking the path of what God wanted us to do. We started helping the Hagans, and we wanted to live someplace else. And God said, no, you're going to live over here. And he gave us this house, and we sold it for double what we paid for it. And it was a wonderful house. It had a tennis court and a swimming pool and a really nice kitchen and, you know. But you know what I did with it when we left there? I left it and put all the money that we had in Branson Church. Why? So that people could come to Branson Church. He's done it. Everything we've got. And if we keep that focus, God will give you more houses and cars and lands and buildings and things and jewelry and motorcycles and boats and than you could ever turn to Matthew 6.33. You don't even have to turn there. They'll put it on the screen. You know what it says. What does it say? What is the kingdom of God? People. 
People leading people to the Lord, showing people His love, showing people who He is. Why did God send His only Son to the earth? People, for you and for me. It's our privilege and honor to show His love to other people. And it's what we should do every single day of our life. It should be the reason we wake up and open our eyes in the morning. God, who are you going to send across my path today? Who am I going to get to talk to today? Who am I going to get to show your love to today? Whose life am I going to get to change? Then when you lay your head on that pillow that night, you're going to feel different than you did the day before. And if you're not coming in contact with people, I told Keith this in between the services, you know. I said, you know what? Had Jesus not have gone out into the world, the woman with the issue of blood, he would never come in contact with her. Half the stories that we have in the New Testament, Jesus was out among the people. And you know what? He didn't sin. And he wasn't too good to be out among the people. So if you're not coming in contact with anybody that needs to be ministered to, I might check my life. And I might see, Lord, what am I doing? When I go in the Walmart store and somebody knocks something off the shelf. Do I just look at them and judge them? You didn't pick that up? Or do you see how quickly you can pick it up for them? There's things that you can do every day that minister God's love to people. Let's start checking our hearts. Let's start seeing what we can do to show the realness of God, not the phoniness of God. Not just use the right words and say the right cliches and say the right things that we've learned and been taught. But from our hearts, show the true God and who He really, really is. And minister His love to people that will change their lives. And keep them from going to hell for eternity. Can we do that? Josh, are you ready again? Josh has got a song that I think will minister to you. And then I'm going to turn it over to the most handsomest man I know.
Thank you, Lord. 